Disclaimer, I wrote this script like five times because rather than focusing exclusively on the fun parts that I like, which is kind of my thing, I'm going to be more thorough for this review and hold Daggerheart to a higher standard, especially in this playtest phase when they can make changes. So yes, I filled out the open beta playtest survey, and you should too, but let's get into this. The game is called Daggerheart. It's a fun and fresh update to the fantasy genre of RPGs, and it's been designed for long-term campaign play and character progression. We've been working on it for a while, and we're super excited for you to check it out. Now, about a year later, we can finally put these claims to the test by playtesting Daggerheart with the open beta rule set. And while I haven't had time yet for a long campaign, I have had the chance to read, play, and run this game with my home group to see just how fun and fresh Daggerheart actually is or isn't. Because I'm Bob, and this is where we learn how to have more fun playing RPGs together, but this video will be a proper review, not just the fun stuff. So real quick, for full transparency, even though I will probably still end up with at least some comments calling me a shill for Critical Role now, one, I was invited to and played in a private playtest session with some of Daggerheart's designers before the open beta began. Two, I was invited to use closed beta playtest materials, but opted not to do that because I didn't want to sign the NDA. And three, I was offered this physical version of the open beta playtest materials, which I obviously accepted. Importantly, YouTube guidelines consider this box as payment, so you may have noticed a paid promotion sticker at the beginning of this video, but there was no monetary payment, there was no contract, no NDA, no conditions from Darrington Press about what I should or should not say. They did tell me that they wanted people receiving the box to make some kind of Daggerheart content within a couple weeks, but I was already gonna do that. Um, actually, I looked at the emails uh, with the PR person from Darrington Press, and they only said, we want you to share your open and honest ideas with us in the playtest survey on daggerheart.com. I totally misread that, thought it said like, share your ideas with your audience. And then I brought up the idea of like, oh, when should I make a video about this? So the first elephant in the room that I'd like to address about Daggerheart, because I haven't seen any other reviews really bring this up, is why is Critical Role making this game at all? Not that art needs a reason to exist, but art can be made for the wrong reasons, and it's a little odd that Critical Role, one of, if not the, main internet pop culture face of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> or that, we also do that. Is making their own fantasy tabletop role playing game. Let's not forget the timing of that announcement. Only three months after D&D's publisher, Wizards of the Coast, tried to change their game licensing in such a way so as to effectively cut off all other publishers from using D&D material that they had previously been promised could be used indefinitely. On the surface, this timing makes Daggerheart seem like an act of business insurance, or you might say, a role made with fear. But there's other evidence that this may have been a role made with hope, as in making a game for the correct reason for their fans to have fun with it. One, the people at Critical Role and Darrington Press obviously love gaming. Play Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Two, Darrington Press had already made several other games, just not a TTRPG yet, at least one longer than one page. And three, they are not rushing it. Darrington Press was the last of the major D&D indie publishers to announce their own game, and they said they had already been working on it for a while. We've been working on it for a while, and we're super excited for you to check it out. So even if that part's not true, they continued to work on it in private playtests for a year until just recently releasing this open beta, and they've stated that the final game won't be ready until 2025, about another year from now, or longer. So my first conclusion here on why Daggerheart exists is had it not been for the D&D licensing controversy of early 2023, Critical Role probably still would have made their own game, but I think it would have been smaller, more simple, more original, and or taken several more years to actually do it compared to what we're seeing with Daggerheart. What we're seeing with Daggerheart is not a small or simple TTRPG. Call me a lazy DM and I kind of am, but when I saw 20 plus PDFs in the open beta playtest pack, one of them coming in at 377 pages, I almost checked out right there. 
because of that bulk of material, especially for getting into a new game, is not fun for me. It's intimidating. Yeah, D&D 5e's core rules are over 200 pages, but the starter set rules are more than enough for me as a GM. Dungeon Crawl Classics is over 500 pages, but the 40-page quick start rulebook has it covered, and I like the course so much that I cut it down into my own personal booklet version. And Shadow Dark, a new favorite of mine, is about 300 pages, but that book is only digest size, has a bigger font than usual, and has very concise writing, so all together it's easier to read and reference than any of these other fantasy TTRPG rulebooks and PDFs. As a brief aside, that's why I'm writing my first book to be compatible with D&D 5e and Shadow Dark. And low-key, part of me wants to make it compatible with Daggerheart, because Daggerheart, in its current state, is completely missing what this book is going to offer. It's called Delve, How to Build and Survive Deadly Dungeons. It's going to have theory and advice for both creating and navigating dungeon environments. Similar guidelines and new rules for traps, hazards, and puzzles, and a bunch of dungeons and traps to plug right into your game. It's going to have player options like new races and new 5e subclasses geared toward indoor exploration and new Shadow Dark talent tables. And I couldn't do all this without my partners at Eventier Games, who have already published several successful 5e books through Kickstarter, because they're hooking us up with dice with trap cards and cards for dozens of new monsters going in the book, some being designed by your favorite YouTube creators like Ginny D, Pointy Hat, Professor DM, and more. And if you want to get some special holographic monster cards, which you know you do, you want to sign up through the link below to be notified when Delve goes live on Kickstarter soon. Anyway, despite the Daggerheart open beta playtest containing over 600 pages of material, this reviewer box was a much smaller package with exactly what I wanted and really exactly what you need. One pagers on character creation, the basic rules and equipment, pre-generated characters, and the cards, so I didn't have to print them all out. I just wish more people had access to the materials organized in this way because it was much easier to flip through and get to the fun part. But before I talk about the fun, and less fun, parts of my home group session, we should address the other elephant in the Daggerheart room, our other big claim and question, is it fresh? Let's begin with a flashback. August 2023, Polygon publishes an article, Daggerheart, the critical role publisher's answer to D&D feels indistinct. Subtitle, who asked for another medieval if you squint TTRPG? And at the time, I was pretty unhappy with this description, Today, I still don't love it. I still think it's kind of unfair, but I do completely understand where they're coming from. D&D 5e's core rule is 1d20, roll high, add strength, dex, constitution, wisdom, intelligence, charisma. Daggerhearts is 2d12, roll high, adding strength, agility, finesse, awareness, knowledge, presence. It's a lot of synonyms. But D&D characters have a background, species, class, subclass, feats, and they level up to unlock new abilities. While Daggerheart characters have a community, ancestry, class, foundation subclass, and domain abilities, leveling up to unlock new ones. Okay, well, what about the base features of each character class in Daggerheart? The bard doesn't inspire their allies, they rally the whole party. But I do really like the fact that it triggers based on the party's number of rolls with fear. That's a smart adaptation to this rule set. And the Daggerheart Druid does not wild shape. Oh no, they beast form. And they use templates for a few unique creatures that are easier to manage for players and GMs instead of worrying about any stat block the character could choose. <laughs> Plus, these druids automatically get a minor feature that is identical to the 5e druid craft cantrip, and that's just pretty cool. Now, the Guardian class, which I originally thought was exactly like a D&D 5e cleric, is actually almost exactly like a 5e barbarian, not raging, but becoming unstoppable to resist physical damage and boost their own damage. The Ranger's Focus feature is pretty similar to 5e Hunter's Mark, which every 5e Ranger should take, and the Daggerheart Rogue has Sneak Attack straight up. Why would you do it any other way, though? 
And the Seraph class, however, which I thought was like a 5e paladin, is quite unique. They get a prayer die to reduce incoming damage, boost their own rolls, or give hope to their allies, and it's pretty awesome. The Sorcerer automatically gets 5e Detect Magic and Minor Illusion, and an interesting feature called Channel Raw Power, which lets them sacrifice one of their domain cards for the day to gain some hope or boost some damage, while the Wizard automatically gets Prestidigitation and a seemingly very good feature for gaining hope or clearing stress automatically on at least one out of 12 rolls if I did the math right. And the Warrior is probably my favorite Daggerheart class alongside the Seraph because, like in DCC and Shattered Ark, it leans into the fiction of letting this martial master perform fun stunts. Nonetheless, you do not even need to squint to see that these classes are, generally speaking, conversions of D&D 5e classes to Daggerheart, much more than they are fresh takes on fantasy archetypes. Now, I'm going to talk about the good and the bad of what that really means, but first, I want to walk through the features of Daggerheart's ancestries, because while their aesthetics are mostly similar to 5e, I think these features do feel more original to me. Clank, aka Warforged, gets an extra plus one to one experience, basically a skill, so that one is pretty similar. Daemon, aka Tiefling, gets advantage to intimidate non daemons and they can choose to mark stress instead of giving the GM fear. Cool. Dracona, aka Dragonborn, gets an elemental breath, and that's also the same, but it's also the coolest thing a dragon character can do, so why would you do it any other way? Dwarves, aka Dwarves, can spend hope to resist damage. Nice. Elves still have a trance feature, but it does something cool by making it easier to clear stress and hit points when you rest. Fairies are a fun new addition that can mark stress to fly or make a reroll of the duality dice. Fawns, aka satyrs, give the GM fear to make a headbutt. And first impression, I feel like that's kind of expensive because most of these features only cost stress, not fear, but I don't know. Fungril are another fun addition pun intended, I don't know, with a super flavorful feature of accessing their fungi hive mind of information, that's super neat. Galapa, aka Tortles, get a shell that boosts their armor, which is also the same as 5e, but also intuitive. Giant, aka Goliath, get extra hit points and further reach in combat, which is awesome. Goblins can spend stress to make the GM re-roll an attack, cool. Halflings give everyone in the party extra hope, very Lord of the Rings, but also DCC where they give extra luck, and they can re-roll ones like in 5e. Humans can spend hope to re-roll when they use their experience, and Katari, aka Tabaxi, can mark stress to re-roll their hope die. Still going. Orcs seem super tough because one out of three times they try to reduce incoming damage with armor, they don't actually have to mark that armor. Ribbits, aka the best guys ever, can breathe underwater and use their tongue to grab things or attack by marking stress. And finally, Samaya, the little monkey guys, have advantage on rolls to balance and climb. So, the core role, the stats, the classes, the ancestries, are they fun? Yes, definitely. Are they fresh? Not, no, like they're very familiar. Do note that there are more unique subclass features and domain abilities, which you can all get at level one. So your character can do more right away and be highly customized, but I'm not gonna go through all these cards too. And note how the rest of these core rules are pretty original. You got these duality dice for hope and fear, generating resources for the players or the GM on every roll. You have free form, improvisational turn order, which we'll talk about in my session overview. And you have other resources like stress and armor slots to avoid damage. There's custom skills. There's custom paths for leveling up. There's combo tag team moves that I really like. The stick is in my face. But even with these fresh mechanics, Daggerheart's personality and the inherent setting that comes out of these rules is almost exactly the same flavor of high fantasy as 5th edition Forgotten Realms D&D. Like the two differences I can clearly see are one, where D&D uses a hard magic system, it's well studied and calculable. Daggerheart is specifically going for a soft magic system where it's more mysterious like the force in Star Wars, bending in Avatar, and I like that. And two, 
Daggerheart leans heavily into drama, surprise surprise. For example, the character background questions and connections all include one or more prompts about near-death experiences and extreme betrayals and hidden love, and this is all at level one. So overall, superficially, and kind of in the first layer or so of mechanics, Daggerheart is a lot like D&D 5e, and I think this is both good and bad. The bad. I completely understand why people wanted something more fresh from Critical Role. Darrington Press is not just another indie game studio. They're backed by a multi-million dollar media company, Critical Role. <laughs> Still, even with all that investment, I think it was silly to expect Darrington Press to deviate from what the fans of Critical Role know and love. In other words, I think it was perfectly logical for Critical Role to model the feeling of their TTRPG on D&D, and the wonderfully dramatic performances of their cast. And here's the really good part about that. I think that Daggerheart being like D&D 5e could boost the entire TTRPG industry, and I'll tell you why. The majority of people who have ever played a tabletop role-playing game have only ever played D&D 5e. But now that the internet pop culture face of D&D 5e is making a new game that is still perfectly palatable to their huge audience, Daggerheart is likely to become the biggest and best bridge, a pipeline, the link that has been missing for those players to go from saying, why would I play any other game besides D&D, to saying, dang it, this train is ruining my bit. <laughs> those people who have never and probably would never play another game are now going to try their first other game. And once you learn that next RPG, it's so much easier to learn any other RPG. And I think they will. So maybe that's me like giving Critical Role a pass, but I don't think Daggerheart has to be fresh. Remember Pathfinder 1E? It just had to be familiar and fun. And so, all right, now we're gonna round this out with whether or not my group thinks it's fun and whether or not I would run this game again. The results might surprise you. <laughs> you gotta be able to hear that train. So I recently ran the introductory Daggerheart playtest adventure, The Sablewood Messengers, for two players from my normal group, both experienced with D&D 5e and a handful of other RPGs because we play more than one game. The adventure comes with pre-gens, but we made custom characters by following the steps in the box, and while there are a lot of steps, both players reported that the process felt straightforward and hard to mess up. Not only because the steps made it very clear, but they also praised the organization and visuals on the character sheet, as well as the cards, for being easy to pass around and then plop down next to their sheet, and because they look really cool. One player said that having a specific character sheet for each class is weird, and I agree, it means the GM or the player has to print out these specific sheets ahead of time, but this approach does lend itself to the better organization, so I think it was worth it. And also from the sheets, we all really liked the background and character connection questions. It was fun and straightforward as a way to unite the party, though I stand by my comments on these prompts being a bit too dramatic for my taste when every level one character has a story of incredible loss, but you don't have to use them all, I guess, so. And the moment you've been waiting for, my players did come right out and say that combat with no initiative order was fine for two players, but thought it would be tricky even in our full group of respectful players. So not that people would be barking over each other, but just that some kind of defined order is kind of better than nothing. To my surprise, my players also liked HP thresholds. They admitted that it's kind of an extra step compared to D&D, but liked being able to choose whether or not to spend armor to reduce the power of an incoming attack. And blatantly, they liked rolling more dice and getting big numbers, even though you only end up taking or dealing one to three hit points of damage. And similarly, they loved the bits, as in the tokens you roll to represent modifiers, the action tokens, having minis on the table, which we normally don't do, and even things like filling in hit points and hope and armor slots on the character sheet. It's all much more visual and much less mathematical than D&D. But for me as the GM, the bits, specifically the action tokens and the fear tokens, were a mixed bag. I liked the visuals, and I was prepared enough that it felt easy to track these different bits, making sure players gave me a token on their turn, or when they rolled with fear, and exchanging action tokens for fear tokens, and spending both of them on different kinds of moves. It was pretty fun for me because it was so gamified, 
but all that accounting kept me busy on my turn. And it had me thinking more like, how can I spend these bits to do something fun and cool instead of starting with a fun and cool idea, then figuring out how to do it. Essentially, it felt a little limiting to our typical rule of cool style. Also, I was so focused on these tactile and visual elements that I wasn't imagining the game itself, the scene, as clearly as I usually do. So I was forgetting to describe things during combat on a lot of my turns. So maybe with more practice, that would smooth out for me. But I have to tell you, my best idea for some sweet merch that Critical Role can and should make for Daggerheart before someone else does. And this is gonna sound silly at first, but hear me out. Instead of the action tracker card, and otherwise just having like gems and coins scattered all over the table amongst our miniatures and our cards and our character sheets and our drinks and our snacks, etc., I would have loved to consolidate all those bits into a tiny abacus that stands on the table between the GM and one helpful player who can slide across action tokens when the players act, then I slide them back when I activate monsters, and I can have the fear tokens on there for me, and even track hope on there too with different colors for different players. I'm calling it now. Someone will make that, and it will make bank if Daggerheart does well. And that's my idea, so email me, bobworldbuilder at gmail.com, we'll negotiate a modest royalty percentage, win-win. However, the undeniable usefulness of that tiny abacus is also the quintessential example for why Daggerheart might not be my thing, at least as a game master. I've said it before, I'll say it again. For the last year or two, I really prefer running games with as few things as possible between myself, my players, and our collective imagination. For that same reason, I really loved how Daggerheart rules and even the intro adventure pushed the GM to have the players add detail to the world. I already do that all the time for NPC names and combat descriptions, but whenever I remember to open that up to scene descriptions and more, it's fun and it takes pressure off the GM while getting the players more involved. So I hope more people try that in whatever game you're playing, not just Daggerheart. And for what it's worth, both of my experienced players were like, we want to play a whole campaign with this game, though it probably helped that one of them crit like seven times in our two hour session. They literally rolled double 12s on the first roll of the game, then later they rolled double 11s, then they rolled double 10s before breaking that streak and critting more times, but still, that was super weird. So all in all, Daggerheart is fun. It's not very fresh, but that has its perks, and it's totally and utterly dungeonless. So if you like cards and dungeons, sign up through the link below to be notified when the Delve Kickstarter campaign goes live soon. Thanks again to Darrington Press for sending this sweet, sweet box. Thanks to the Bob World Builder patrons who make all of this possible, and keep building.